Hello, and welcome to the Practice Marketing Podcast, highlighting successful strategies from North America's fastest growing clinics, so you can learn from their wins and power your practice growth. Hi, I'm your host, Neil Trickett, CEO of Practice Promotions. In today's focus, we're going to talk about how to market your clinic the right way for multi-location uh, clinics, right, for multi-location practice. So we're really excited to have uh, Colin Vosick here and Olivia Mansfield from Connecticut Physical Therapy. It's a successful three-location practice in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, Colin is the business manager and Olivia is the marketing coordinator. And today they're going to share their wisdom on how to market a multi-location practice. So welcome, Colin. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you for having us. Yeah, awesome. So let's jump right in here. Let's talk about this. So uh, Connecticut Physical Therapist Specialists, um, three location across the Hartford area in Connecticut. And uh, just wanted to see from you, like, how are things, you know, going for you in your in your practice as you've grown and you've gone to three locations? Sure. I think, uh, well, to answer it directly, things are going great. Uh, very, very busy here, even coming off the cusp of what sometimes is considered a more slow part of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, Now I I do believe that that is directly born from some of the strategies we're employing with obviously practice promotions, but uh, some of the ideas that you all brought to the attention and others that we've been working on for our whole history has really kind of hit an inflection point. I would say in the last couple of years almost to where we've developed some corporate inertia and are able to turn that into a little bit more exponential growth. Yeah. Oh, I love that corporate inertia. That just <laughs> that that is it. That's the key phrase right there. Corporate <laughs> inertia, man. Uh, like you just captured it because, yeah. I, um, you probably I don't know if you ever read Jim Collins' book, uh, mm-hmm. Good to Great. Right, same mm-hmm. thing. Right, he talks about the flywheel, big right, heavy right. flywheel that takes a lot of you know uh, effort to get that thing moving to get over the inertia, and then it starts to spin up. Right. And so sometimes we feel that way in our business, like, hey, we just want this, you know, we put this thing in place. Why is it not working? It just takes it's the universe, right? It just takes some time for things to get moving. So I love it. You just coined it corporate inertia, man. Let's love it. (laughs) So do you bring up that book, Good to Great? Because that's that book really resonated with me specifically, because I don't know if you know this, Neil, but this is my family's company. My father started this practice in 2012. And so I represent that next leader that has to bring that company, hopefully towards greatness, but also just some of the ideas in that book about not relying on like the personality cult or that mm-hmm. charismatic person really being able to be a spot leader where I want to be more of systemized and more rear facing. Not that I'm not looking for where we're going, but listening to the people where, where I need to take this bus. So I, I love it. Yeah. So you're, you, you're you've transitioned into that whole next phase in in practice, which is you know as a as a one location practice. Yes, you're fo- you're focused on business, but you're a little leaner, you're a little meaner. You can you can pivot faster, right? When things are happening, you 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 have a certain amount of staff that you're working with, but that grows, right? And the complexities increase as you get bigger and you start to add on additional locations. And there's there's a whole another business dimension that starts to happen as you expand into business, uh, multiple locations. And so, you know, that's why I'm really looking forward to, you know, our conversation today and learning from you what you've done to be successful as you've, you know, expanded. And this is for our audience there that has multiple location clinics out there, or they're thinking about that next, you know, step for them and growing another uh, practice and then opening another location. So uh, one of the things that I've seen, because we work with a lot of multiple location clinics and multiple discipline clinics, and one of the things that I that I typically see a very common issue is that you know as the business grows and you have multiple locations, there tends to be one location or two couple locations that are doing great, crushing it, right? And then there's other ones that are that are behind, right? And they seem to have the most challenges. So I was wondering, in your situation, have you had that you know come up where you have some underperforming clinics, and what have you kind of done to overcome that? Sure. Um, so we've definitely had the the classic underperforming clinic although but <laughs> of some of what our answers were to them or that underperforming clinic may not be exactly what you're looking for here uh there's a, just to use a brief anecdote so we had uh basically like a satellite office down in uncasville connecticut so it's a little bit removed from the hartford area i used to talk about it saying that even like having a printer problem down there represented three hours of my time going down and back and so 
after COVID, that place, again, being a satellite location, only a couple employees, it never really came back. And we had opened up our West Hartford location right in the middle of COVID. And that was going gangbusters. And so we had to make the decision to consolidate to grow at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've had down times for sure. Like maybe not an overall underperforming clinic. We used to experience pretty severe drops in volume in December, in January, when the deductibles restarted. Also kind of the, the dog days of summer, those last few weeks in August or so. Um, and when we started to face that, and we have also, we were growing though. So we had more people, more people on staff, more people on payroll. So those holes in the schedule were even more visible and, uh -huh. and even uh, a little bit more difficult to handle. And so what we realized that we needed is consistent, trackable marketing is what we needed. And we weren't really doing it. We had done a kind of the classic passive stuff anywhere. You might sponsor a little league team throw a sign up in the middle of the town. We'll go do one trade show sometimes, but not be consistent with it. We might go visit an attorney this week, but not do that again for a month. And so we weren't really doing the things that reduced the valleys from the peaks. Mm -hmm. And I think once we started doing that in correlation, also, like I, I mentioned, working with you guys, you guys revamping our website, really bring some systemized and some almost evidence-based technology to the website. That's really where we saw a severe turn. And since we went live with you guys, which was 2022, we did not have a dead time in January, February. It, it, we were seeing historical greats in, or historical highs in volume that first January and February. And then if I fast forward through a whole year of tracking the metrics, keeping an eye on what our conversion rate is, seeing where their opportunities are in Google ads and such. We have hit over 600 visits for the past, I think, three weeks. Two of them, or yeah, I'm sorry, let's go back. Our first 600 um, visit week was in February. We saw the most amount of people, most amount of bill visits in this month of February, 28 days than we've ever done. In company That's history. amazing. Wow. I love to hear that. That's fantastic. I think, I think you brought to light there just something again that I've seen very commonly and, and but you, you, you experienced it and then you changed, right? And, and that is as you start to add additional clinics and the business complexity goes up, what I see is often is that clinics from a, from a marketing perspective, they keep doing what they did as a single location, right? You can you can really rely on your reputation and not and not really have to have as much of a marketing machine mm -hmm. at a single practice as when you start to grow and you have multiple locations, the complexity of marketing goes up too. But I, I find that clinics don't level up their marketing per se uh, in that yeah. in that instance. But you experienced that, and then you said, "Hey, we got to change here, right? We got to mm -hmm. we got to level up our marketing." Yeah, we we. We've tried to bear that through a lot of different facets of our company. As we grow, the importance of systems and trackable systems, I did pay attention to metrics. It becomes even more important. Yeah. So can you speak to that a little bit, uh, like in terms of monitoring performance at, uh, at a clinic level? And so like, do you have certain, you know, metrics or targets that you're looking at, you know, on a clinic basis? Yeah. So um, I just do it for a couple right off the top of my head. I mean, so our model... In, in our in our practice is a we only we don't use any aids we don't use any text there's no real PT extenders so it's one on one with the DPTs we schedule two an hour two per hour at the top and bottom of each hour and so with that type of one on one very specific very individualized care it's important for the schedule to be full and so one of the kind of ideal that we see is we want our people to see about sixteen patients or to at least be scheduled with sixteen patients a day conceptually or usually on average, they're ending around the 14, 13 mark. And so by the end of the week, they should be around 65. And so if all nine PTs are at 65, then we know we're kind of, we're operating at capacity. From a per visit standpoint, I like to see about $90 per collect per uh, data service collection. Um, that was, I read that in like an old PPS article, I think somewhere that that's where venture capitalists start to look at your company at the $90 mark. But that's always been a benchmark in my mind and if we're at that, then I know that our accounts and everything seems to be moving along well. And so I'm constantly tracking what where our gross collections are per month, per week, per day. 
and then the visits underneath that at the same time frame. And so I would say those are two quick metrics that that were very important. And some of the metrics that I also keep track on, but don't have to go into, I would suggest that people do that KPI study with PPS. Like that was really helpful in kind of peering back or pulling back the curtain a little bit as to what the bigger guys even look at. Mm. And so, you know, where we yeah. need to go. Yeah, so because because what got you here won't get you there, right? So being exactly. able to see people who are ahead of you, what they're doing, and start to adapt towards that. I love it. Yeah, and and from your end, uh, Olivia, is there anything that's changed for you monitoring marketing performance at different clinics? Yeah. So um, before we were involved with you guys, we kind of were just basing it on, you know, do we have a wait list? Do how many people are waiting to get in? And you can see, okay, we're busy. We're not, how many holes are in the schedule? Things like that. Um, and then once we started with you guys, the really cool thing that I like is that we have the whole stat tracker that we fill out at the end of each week. And we can now, now that we've been with you guys for, for two years, we can go back and look at the trends of how much we've grown, how many new, like more new patients we're seeing, how many more returning patients we're seeing, patients per per week that we're seeing that just increases every year. So it's it's just raw data of how much we are improving upon each year. Um, also just the overall need, how many, like how many hires we're making for physical therapists um, to fill the need that we do have. Um, obviously it's a good sign if you're so busy that you now need another provider. Um, so things like that are definitely really important. And I think too, um, like we touched on earlier, what works for Granby might not work for West Hartford, or it might be the same, or what works for Glastonbury is a little bit different. Like in our West Hartford office, we see a ton of workman's comp and a ton of motor vehicle and LOP. So we focus a little bit more of our marketing to attorneys and the doctors in the area and stuff like that. But in Granby, a lot of it's just household name. Um, they've seen us for, we've been there for 12 years. They know us by name by now. And so that's a little bit what drives Granby. Um, and then obviously Glastonbury is our newest location. So, um, we're kind of trying to combine both of those into mm -hmm. Glastonbury. Mm -hmm. I love the way that you've approached that because, uh, that's again, another issue that you see is you start, you think, Hey, I'm going to open that next location or, you know, we're four locations. We're going to open that next one. And yeah. it's amazing, especially, you know, in certain areas of the country, how one town can differ compared to others. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. if you, you're going into a, basically a new market, right? Oh, and yeah. that new market, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, it might be much heavier for uh, attorneys, right? And, and marketing to attorneys, right? Yeah. Versus um, if, if you're a bit more rural, uh, you know, you can do some online marketing, but you might need some more boots on the ground or more direct mail and those kind of things, yep. right? It just depends on where you're going and the type of audience that you're tracking. So what works for you in one, loca one uh, clinic location may not work as well in that other clinic location. So I love the way that you looked at that. Yeah. One other piece that I can add to that idea in the town versus town, sometimes even geographical barriers change what we do. So like we moved a Hartford location to a West Hartford. There's no real, they, they border. There's no barriers there. So a lot of our people that we saw there came right over. Same mm -hmm. referral, same referral um, partners, same everything. But when we opened a practice in Glastonbury, that's across a river and people that sought care, people had services, people lived their lives on this side, don't go to that side and yeah. vice versa. And so it was like a brand new opportunity for marketing and so why, why Olivia brought up the blend of Granby and West Hartford is like we really applied a lot of Granby strategies when we were one clinic strong here in the beginning, because that's where we came from. It's almost like this is a completely walled off location mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah, that's fascinating because I, I, I've seen it too. I, I uh, grew up mostly in South Florida area, so super dense city. It's pretty much 60 miles of city, even though they all have different names. Um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, because I, I used to drive, I used to uh, work on the beach, and then I was like 15 miles away, and it was an hour and a half drive right through traffic. So people would not go like two or three miles outside the radius of their home or work, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I hear what you're saying there, and I know there's certain certain areas where there's like a river through the city, and like you said, people won't go on one side versus the other. It's just really interesting, those geographic uh, boundaries that people have there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, Olivia, I, I think you brought up a great point there of starting to really look at some core metrics when it comes to marketing. And of course, we all focus on new patients, we focus on patient visits, but it's really surprising to me when I ask clinics that, 
you know, what is your number of reactivated patients? Like they don't track that. And so a, a huge portion of your business is recurring business, right? It's recurring yeah, patients. Absolutely. Uh, that, yeah. that, that, that's a, in any, any business, it's the premier way to grow your, you know, your business, right? Is, is your customer list. And so we need to be able to track that and make sure that, are you looking at that? So of that portion of new patients that you have, how many people are brand new, never been to you before, and how many people are coming back? And like being able to differentiate that gives you, you know, a good pulse on, hey, where do I put my marketing efforts here? Do I do I need to, am I getting a lot of returning patients here? I need to put more efforts on getting brand new people in the door? Or am I getting a lot of brand new people, but not many returning patients? I need to put some effort on re getting patient reactivation campaigns going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, I like the way they're tracking that there. And so um, what, what's been your most recent location that you've opened? Um, the clinic that we are in today here in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Um, it's the third location open. Um, it's kind of took the place of what Uncasville was just to a larger, larger uh, standpoint, larger footprint. Um, we were here, we, our first clinical day was September of 2022. And so we started off because we were using our same currently staffed providers when we first opened this place. And we were open, I think it was a Tuesday afternoon first. Yeah, Tuesday afternoon first. And then, I mean, it happened a lot quicker than even I anticipated. I'm usually the, the one pushing, pushing, pushing. Oh, it'll be great, it'll be great, it'll be great. That, that, that driving force, but even faster than I would hoped, we needed that Thursday, and then very quickly we brought my uh, my father's still part of the clinical staff here and and heads the clinical operations obviously, and we use him a little bit as like a canary in the coal mine. If there's ever a over excess volume, and if my father's doing too much, then we need another provider. It's kind of <laughs> how we do <laughs> stuff that. But um, he was doing another full schedule Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then we had to bring Kyle over on Wednesday, but now we're open four days a week from nine 30 to six 30. And that happened. I want to say really fast. like six months, maybe mm, nice. six, seven months. And I know at like the, the four or five months in Mark, because I remember some conversations I was having during that time period, we were at like 500% growth. And so wow. that, and maybe it was, it was a little serendipitous. So that was the same year that we joined with practice promotions and really started to pour some gasoline on some of our uh, marketing strategies, rebuilt the website, reintroduced that aspect of that to the community writ large. We were able to use our very strong name and brand in our other locations to kind of leverage point from an SEO standpoint, and then also talks and just because the doctor's in Rocky Hill and has referred to West Hartford doesn't mean he doesn't have Glastonbury patients too. And so through a kind of a variety of that, but using our ex past experiences with you guys is really what our strategies were for, for Glastonbury. And it worked out great. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the nice thing with opening a new location. You do have a little bit of things to pull over. Like you're obviously your main website and you know, the location page and things like that on there, but you know, you have, you have some online recognition, um, versus starting from scratch right yeah. in, in the area um w was there other uh things that that you did um to really get that clinic off the ground as quickly as possible from a marketing perspective yeah i was i mean we definitely utilized the website we were talking with um our PPC specialist, Justin, who was fantastic. Um, and we kind of dumped a little bit more of our money um, up for the Google ads into Glastonbury. And we took it from like West Hartford and Granby because those were already um, strong uh, performance wise. And so we dumped a little bit more into that to just try to build up the growth of it. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, we made a PT hire, I think, right? We, made, kind of we did. We had to make a PT hire around that time. But specifically, Olivia and I, we used to do the kind of going out on the paper route. Yeah, we would go out and and talk to MDs in the area and and attorneys in the area and um, kind of use our skill set from West Hartford and our skill set from Granby and kind of transfer it over um, into here. And so we were able to like there's an attorney in the area. We were able to kind of secure them, if you will. And now they only send their 
clientele to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, with some of the doctors in the area, um, just reminding them, Hey, like we're here and like meeting them and, and talking to them. And a big part of it, I think was patients that would come in with a doctor we didn't know. And yeah. then they would go and tell their doctor, Oh, we really liked them. Loved it. They, we would send them off with some of our information, stuff like that to kind of just yeah. get our name out there as best as we can. And now, um, being in Glastonbury for the decent amount of time that we've been in, we're starting to see the uh, kind of the Granby style of marketing where people know us by name because, you know, a family member came in or um, we work really closely with the athletic trainer um, from UConn, uh, Return to Sport. And he is a great referral source here. Um, he sends all of his people over, but, and it kind of turns into, you know, then we're seeing, we saw one of his clients and then we're seeing the mom and the dad and just stuff like that, that yeah. kind of that organic type of growth um is really really helpful there's a couple yeah. things even just from glastonbury that were unique to glastonbury and this building so we now are the like the main leaseholder or major leaseholder here so all the other subtenants lease from us currently um but when we started in this building we were just one of the subtenants and didn't really know all of the other players but olivia brought up the yukon return to sport it's a institute of sports medicine um program we get referrals from there but also, this is where Glastonbury High School trains. All of their athletes train here. Uh, I guess a long time ago, Glastonbury High School knocked down their weight room and just never got the chance to rebuild it. And so they, they have been with this building for the past three years. And But now that we're in charge and we're the kind of the forward-facing aspect of it, it's like a baked-in referral source. It's a baked yeah. in source of patients because the kids are naturally coming into our building. Mm-hmm. We're able to provide them with a little bit of value, whether it's just helping them out while they're working out or what mm-hmm. have you. But if they have a an actual injury or dysfunction, we're right here. So mm-hmm. it's, it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, I love it. You've looked at lots of different angles there. I, I think you looked at obviously the location and opportunities for future, right? And and building relationship marketing that way. Um, you know, I, love it. I like what you said there about how you reallocated um, some efforts and budget for launching a new clinic. And that's one of the things too that I've seen is that sometimes clinic um, practice owners, they they open a new location, but they don't necessarily look at the the shift in marketing budget for that location. Yeah. And ads is a great way to get things off the ground at a relatively quick pace. It's like your short-term game and SEO is your long-term game. So, you know, if you're not doing Google ads out there, it's something you should be doing as a must. But if you're definitely in multiple locations, you can you can reallocate that budget to the the locations that really need it the most um yeah. with that so I, I really like what you did there and then, like you said it takes a little while for that organic growth mm. to start to occur so you got to you got to put the marketing budget the marketing effort there and boots on the ground you know like really get the name out as much as you can and then it starts to gain some traction Uh, as the organic marketing starts to kick in. Do you want more freedom in your clinic? Then you need to work on your business, not just in it. The top practice owners know that they need a marketing system that consistently attracts patients from the internet. And at Practice Promotions, we've helped hundreds of practice owners skyrocket to the top of Google and get more new patients from online. Go to practicepromotions.net slash kit to get our free practice marketing sample kit. It includes all our digital marketing tips and tricks that will get you new patients from Google. That's practicepromotions.net slash kit, K-I-T, for a free marketing kit. And now back to the show. Now, you guys have a, a great uh, relationship here. Uh, you know, as, as PT owners, sometimes we struggle to delegate or trust people with, with our marketing. And, and I'm just kind of curious how, how you guys have worked out that dynamic over the years. I'd say, so I started out as an intern. Yep. <laughs> um, I was just doing Ouch. like social media <laughs> stuff. Like I didn't, I had no idea. So I got my degree in communications with a focus in marketing. And a lot of the stuff, like I had no idea how to do a phys- like market for healthcare or physical therapy. Like I didn't literally, I knew nothing. And so I think working in it and doing the administrative side and learning the business, learning what actually pulls people was the most helpful, honestly. Um, And so I think just kind of growing your knowledge and it's a slow burn. It really is. It's not something that you can kind of just like jump right into. You have to learn, you know, what 
what people want to hear or what will draw them in um, because healthcare, I mean, the biggest thing I've learned is, is the trust aspect is you can spend all your time on social media posting how great you are and posting all this. But the biggest thing is, is the trust aspect. And why should we trust you with, uh, with my healthcare, with my body? Cause this is obviously physical therapy and stuff like that. So that's been the biggest, I think, learning curve for me is, is how do you present it in a way in which people will say, oh, yeah, I, I trust that and I want to go to them. So um, that's been the biggest, I think, the biggest learning learning curve. And then I think you've mentioned, too, how as sometimes the managers or the company grows, you need to delegate some of this stuff away. And so from my father to me and then from a little bit of myself, but then certainly like mine and Olivia's efforts to everybody else. Um, it's it's identifying what works for sure. But what we really focused on is ironing out our, um, what's it called? Like our motto, our core belief, so to speak. Uh -huh. What we believe that creates or makes us and allows us to deliver the top quality product that we do. And so we kind of sat down with my father and, and came up with four or five themes or ideas that should really be seen through everything we put out there. Mm -hmm. And then that's really how we made sure that we kept who we were all the way to who we are with the slight tweaks for the gain in size. And so that's, I would say, like really knowing what you are, having a good handle on your company values, company beliefs is a good starting point. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. And and you got to be able to, like you say, if you, if you get clear on that, then you can really let it flow through the entire organization and the way that you market the things that you're saying. And it's consistent branding, it's consistent messaging. Right. Yeah. And uh, like, uh, yeah, we learned that it's called uh, strategic anchors. Um, so Ryan Dice with, uh, with scalable, they, they talk about that as, you know, you have core values, which is kind of the way that your team operates together, what you believe in, right. To, as far as how you behave and work with each other. And then you get your strategic anchors, which is what makes you different. Yeah. Like why would someone go to you versus someone else? And so you did that. You've identified those four or five core strategic anchors. And, you know, you don't want to have one that just says we provide quality care because everybody says <laughs> we're <that>. better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what really makes you unique? Yeah. Like, what is your approach? Right. And and I think if you can get that identified down, then, then that can. Yeah. Then people can just own it. Right. They know it. They can they rattle it off by heart as they're talking to patients. And, That's, and then, everybody uh, can do it. I think, yeah. too, the biggest thing that I've learned too, is that I fully believe in the people in which I am marketing and the business in which I am marketing. I can say without a doubt, 99.9% .9 of people that come in, they will have a great experience. So it's like having the, the merit and the power behind my words. Um, I think sometimes people can feel that, that it's not this like, yeah, I come to us because we think we're great. It's like, you can actually feel, um, like I said, kind of the power behind the words and the meaning behind the words. To yeah. piggyback on that a little bit, my I come from a primarily sales background prior to coming on and helping out my my father way back when. Um, there was a speaker sometime, I forget who it was, but the idea of if you can truly believe in your product, if your product is, is valuable, but if you know in your body that you're delivering a needed service, then it becomes your ethical imperative to spread that product, to sell that product in that example, but in here to deliver PT and mm -hmm. make and increase our availability from a schedule standpoint. That's our ethical imperative because of our belief in our product. And so if you can end up in that kind of end zone or, or area, I feel like you can be very powerful with your marketing. Oh man, we got, we got, what, what was that with ethical imperative? Uh, <laughs> right. And we got our, we got our corporate inertia. Our corporate inertia. Man, we're just, this. <laughs> Roll with it. I love it. <laughs> That's so true, though. I, I love what you said with that. Uh, Olivia, I think one thing that that really impresses me that I've seen that that, that I, I think I, I've seen with some some marketing directors get it, and a lot don't. And that is, and then I think this comes back to the practice owner. So the practice owner, what they want that marketing director to do. You, like you say, you have to really get into the company and understand it from a. Yeah. You know, an operational level. And I think what happens is from a marketing director standpoint is they kind of like, no, 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 don't, don't look at that. Just go do the marketing. And a lot of times they might treat them actually just like a physician liaison, like, Hey, go out and meet a bunch of doctors. Mm -hmm. That's a sales. That's a, that's not a marketing position. That's a sales oh. position. You're going out marketing to doctors. Uh, but you know, from a marketing 
you know, the, the marketing director is actually the coordinator of the marketing, right? So they, they're the ones making sure that all the things that are happening within the clinic, how can we convey that message out to the public, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you got to know that audience. And so I think sometimes the marketing directors don't get enough time uh, to spend within the clinic to understand everything that's going on to really then be able to convey that message very well. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it definitely gives you, um, now that I'm, you know, I've been here for almost four years, I think it is, yeah. it gives you a huge leg up um, when it comes to, I mean, just in meetings and talking to people just in every yeah. bit of it, because I I now have all this knowledge that I didn't have when I first started. And I, if I was just marketing this, not having actually done the administrative work, been in the job, been with the PTs for nine hours a day, <laughs> been doing the administrative staff stuff for nine hours a day, it, you know, I don't think that it would be as successful as it has been. Absolutely. Yeah. Not. And in our meetings, it's uber important to have a confidence level so that yeah. if there's nothing ambiguous about your business, then there usually isn't a question that you end up stuttering over. Yeah. But it can be taken even down to one-on-one -on -one interaction with the patients. They might ask you a random question or or not. It could be a run-of-the-mill question, but the ability to kind of deliver it in a powerful or clear, but concise and cogent manner is very important. Very mm -hmm. important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of that is what we do here at Practice Promotions is, you know, we have people from within the industry. So like our head of contents, been a former practice owner, PT, right? We've had, we have a lot of uh, former marketing directors on staff. So they've, they, they know that lingo, they know that dynamic uh, within the clinics and then being able to help uh, practices convey their own individual messages out. And so if, you, you if you're not really in that environment, it's really hard to understand or know Um you know, what, what to say, right. Or how to approach things. Cause you know, we're a little bit of a unique industry sometimes in what we do. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so, for, so for you two, you, uh, you obviously work with a lot of different resources here, but from a, from a management or marketing type of resources, are there particular ones that you found useful to, to grow in your practice? I would say first and foremost, honestly, rebranding the website was That's, huge. It really, it, was. it really was. Um, it completely changed um, how we're able to, like we've talked about earlier, how we're able to just track things and being able to see like the appointment requests online, something as simple as that, um, has been a huge added benefit, being able to, to look at the calls and, um, to have all the stats and just where everything's coming from. That has been a huge leg up and rebrand. And we have gotten people, um, that said, yeah, I, I saw your message on, uh, on the website and the way in which it was conveyed, they were like, Oh, I really like the website. So I decided to give you guys a shot and I called. And nope. <laughs> that was kind of the biggest, I think, goal for us in rebranding the website is how do we take kind of the unique way that we do physical therapy and apply it to kind of an online platform. So that was definitely the the biggest thing. Um and also, then I was the, no I didn't mean to cut you off, sorry, but also when from my standpoint, the way that you all may or force the issue on focusing on old patients and returning patients yeah. is very smart. I mean, you guys taught us the newsletters, right? Olivia yeah, works the on newsletters them. Are awesome. Olivia helps design and does our custom copy for that. But through like engagement platform, and I don't know why it took me so long to understand this, but as we grow, that net gets larger and larger, right? I mean, like we're up to, I think, over 11,000 unique emails. Nice. So we can just go think and get our message out to 11,000 people using at least the engagement. Uh, what, what is it? What is that platform? It's called, it's called Engage, engage yeah. right? Yeah. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. um, but those strategies would, would be some of the foremost um, ones that come to my mind. Yeah. And then also Olivia helped set up a TV spot. Yeah, for, we did a for, TV special. That was, local community. that was really yeah, awesome. not community, local channel three. Yeah, yeah, that was really that was a good one too. And kind of like what we've been talking about, just going and and marketing to the MDs in the area and attorneys mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that, um, is a is a great way to to do that and accepting the style of patient that we do because a lot of um, some clinics don't. Uh, it takes a lot to, on a claims management um, to <laughs> take the letters of protection, to do the workman's comp cases. It mm -hmm. adds another level to the administrative staff because it, it's more than just, oh, I have United Healthcare and my shoulder hurts. Like that's that's easy peasy. Yeah. Close to that. But when it's a, a different style of patient like that, that definitely um, helps mm -hmm. 
please. And sure. attorneys have a different message than doctors, right? Exactly. Yes. And administrative, it's administrative. You have all the paperwork, yeah. you know, like, exactly. with, you know, 100%. it's different. I am, yeah. <laughs> I a lot know of, of I's <laughs> dot and T's to cross on, exactly. on those things yeah. too. So. Yeah. And that's cool that you did the TV spot. I think, you know, what I've seen there again is that if you, you have to have all the marketing fundamentals in place, right? You have to have mm -hmm. that great machine, the website, online capabilities, the engagement with your patients, and you, and then you can fuel the fire with public relations. Yep. Yeah. Free, the TV spots and your free, you know, events and things going on there. Um, but then that that core marketing more is working well, and you can really expand upon that with that PR side of it. So mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and so just kind of looking at as you as you implemented all these. Uh, you know, marketing actions in your clinic, what kind of effect has that had on your overall business growth? I think it's positive. <laughs> for, positive. Yeah. For a very quick and easy answer, positive. Um, positive. <laughs> and, but I mean, to be a little bit more granular, I mentioned it before, but it takes some of the valleys away from the peaks. We're not so reactive. Yeah. We're, we're, if we're constantly doing the same things, with obviously changing for opportunities, but you're constantly doing the same strategies, then you're not going to have as much as that. All right, we poured some gas on the fire. Now we're super busy. And don't, don't stop, stop, stop. And then we go back down. Yeah. And yeah. so it really helped with that idea. Um, it allows us obviously to deliver our product and get our message out to a wider audience, which mm -hmm. is the goal. But mm -hmm. obviously that then creates uh, business growth, patient volume. Um and, yeah, and I, I think what you're saying there too, Colin, is you're coming back to the corporate inertia yep. again, mm -hmm. right? We we got to keep the uh, momentum going on on that. And and again, that's something where, you know, just, it's just kind of natural in business that, hey, we're busy. Like we don't really think about marketing as much because we're just busy and we're, we're doing our operations and everything. And then all of a sudden, like it starts to slow down. We're like, what happened? Right. Why, why do you think you, like you just don't? There's all kinds of instances that can be, but it's probably because you haven't had as, as much momentum on your marketing. But mm -hmm. but it's one of those things where again where you don't necessarily see, you know, instant change because hey, your marketing slowed down and all of a sudden, you know, next day it's going to slow down. No, it might slow down a month from now, two months from now, and then you're in a dip, right? And then you got to yeah. like, okay, well, we got to get out there and market, right? You got to get out there and market. And then, it, okay, now it takes another month or two to start to ramp back up again. Yeah, back and that's up. what you're saying. You're seeing these kind of swings back and forth. Uh, yeah. But if you're if you're more purposeful, then like you said, instead of being reactive on it, right? If you're proactive and, and you have consistency there in your marketing, you have your strategy going, then you have less of that roller coastering effect and you can, and then you have these building you know, ways as you go up. So I think um, too, one of the, the biggest things that I've seen that's helped with this is who we choose to hire as providers as well. I think that's a huge part of what has helped us be mm -hmm. so successful is that, you know, even if we're in dire need, we're not like, okay, we're just gonna hire someone to hire someone. They have a DPT. Great. Like let's sign them on. It's like the vetting process of that, of wanting somebody that's really going to buy into our product mm -hmm. and buy into what we kind of like our bread and butter. Um, and somebody that, uh, we can trust to deliver, um, and make sure on the promises that we're making of come to us. We're so great. And we have this and that. And it's like, we need to make sure that the providers, um, are the quality was there. And I think that's been the biggest thing that's yeah. been helpful because everybody here, um, there's just this energy that we have. And I feel like it really is kind of the core of why they're so good is that everybody, um, nobody is I'm better than you, or I'm smarter than you, or I know how to do it's everybody is, a, is on a team. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we only will, employ people that are completely bought into that and, and want to be a part of that. As well. That's such a key part of your your operations and your marketing. I mean, yeah, it, you can't market, um, you, you know, poor outcomes and resor results, right? So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have a lot of drop off in your clinic, a lot of cancellations. You got to look internally at your providers, and you know, if they're not they're not you know drinking the Kool Aid and, and working oh, with yeah. the company and trying to promote the company and pro you know promote their services to patients, then you can't, you can spend an awful lot of money on marketing and it's not going to go the direction that you want it to go. Exactly. Exactly. And people will fall, people will fall off, I think yeah. much quicker. 
Yeah. And then you don't get the family member. You don't get that growth, that organic growth, if you yeah. will. Yeah. yeah. So be selective, right? Don't don't um, you know, don't don't settle like you know, we we had this back 13, 14 years ago when I had my practice and it you know, heavily competitive area in South Florida, uh, two schools, right? So you know, it was just, it was a fight to the death for someone with a license and a pulse. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> plus, but uh, I, I remember back then, like one thing that we did a little different was that, you know, back then there really was no social media or anything like that. We, what we did is we, we had our monthly newsletter that we sent out to patients. I would actually send that once a quarter to 2000 therapists in our, in two, two different counties. And so they would get our patient newsletter into their house right and they were like well who are these guys right and they check us out we have our you know website stuff at that time and then when we needed someone we put out an extra postcard campaign to to say hey we're hiring but we already had that you know uh, pr yeah. in the area with with the local pts and we would do things like um uh you know we did workshops for pt so i, I would run workshops for pts and i'd have my other therapist there and and I would do the training and I would ask my other therapist to look who they liked. And then mm -hmm. we would invite them mm -hmm. for, you know, interviews yeah. after that. That's kind of what we do now. Yeah. So in a version of that, we have purposely partnered with the UConn DPT school. And I so see. two to three of their students perform their second or third residency with us mm -hmm. because we might, so my father and the director of the school are very close friends, which is obviously helpful, but <laughs> with a little bit of hand picking, we get good two to three awesome candidates right at the beginning of their career. They mm -hmm. essentially get to perform a 10 week long job interview with us. Mm -hmm. And then come August, it's like, hey, you guys want a job? And I'm certainly no unbiased source, but we're a pretty decent company to work for. You get to, <laughs> you get to practice at the top of your license is a thing that we talk about all the time and just really having that naturally curious uh, clinician, that top notch kind of human, like that Olivia was mentioning, but we get to see if that's that, if that's in the candidate and we mm -hmm. do that, we've got a pipeline and we call it our farm system almost. I think our last, so Eric, Shannon, Tommy, Tom, yeah, last four hires were yeah. the nice students. Yeah. 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 It's such a, a critical thing, right. To have um, that pipeline. Right. And, yeah. and give the opportunities. And yeah, yeah the, there's so much to making sure that you have a great intern program uh, within your business, especially, you know, in a practice. Um, and I'm kind of curious too. do you, you know, one thing in today's world is that, you know, there's a shrinking talent pool. Like there's no, no doubts about that. It's been happening for, for years, even before COVID. Right. Um, I'm curious. And you obviously have that aspect that you're doing is there anything else that you do from a, like a marketing or promotional perspective to to try and attract top talent to your practice I, so it's funny that you asked me that question because it's one of the topics or themes that we're i don't know if it's reached the level of struggling just yet but the having the having identified that this is integral for our practice growth is securing the consistent conditions in we're trying to figure that out right now because fortunate or unfortunate i don't know really what the correct ad adjective needs to be we've been able to pick and access from our personal rolodex of people because i've not had any success literally zero of our people have come from in the clinician side have come from an indeed or come from a zip recruiter or even a linkedin like it's i just i've not seen any success through those particular strategies. And so we tap our Rolodex, we let the school know that we're needing to hire. Mm. They kind of put the word out like a bat signal to their other PT friends. <laughs> um, that's yeah. not so trackable, but <laughs> uh, we've been recently talking about with Justin, our PPC guy and Google ads guy that maybe we get a, a, a PT list and then we start seeing if there can be a targeting ads for targeted ads to that list and so mm -hmm. we, we might try that but i wish i had a better answer because i would love to know Maybe yeah I, I think i think the one thing again that i that i've seen uh, clinics that are more successful at this are mm -hmm. just more they're more proactive about it right than reactive and and mm -hmm. you know it's one of those things again where 
you're you can be busy enough things are kind of running fairly smooth and you're not really thinking about hiring just yet right and what what happens is then something happens right maybe someone you know leaves and it's a it's a super competitive market people are getting marketed for their you know, a new job all the time so um you know people people can leave for whatever reason and then all of a sudden you're like oh i got two three weeks here to make get someone in the door and it's just you're behind the eight ball you know wherever you slice it so i i think in today's uh world as a practice owner you have to treat hiring just uh you know and make it a marketing action right you've got a, just a different audience that's all you, you know you're marketing for new patients and you're marketing to past patients to come back in but what what is your marketing program for 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 hiring right and so you need to build your list you need to have the right message you need to constantly you know market to them in different ways right. um and then it's much better to have a stack of resumes uh in the in the waiting you know mm -hmm. where you can uh say hey you know we're, a job opening's coming maybe four months from now like let's keep in touch you know that's the ideal scene versus the yeah. other way around right. that's important that's important we i guess so, so we're not necessarily we didn't have it don't have the list and we're not consistently marketing to that person yet so that's a that, that is absolutely important i can see that but we've always our primary focus is making sure we don't rush that hiring process because we have the need because we have the only the two or three weeks so we've very purposely designed a first and second interview process the questions selected by our lead pts are very purposely designed to be asked on the second or first interview. And so we've really refined that process to kind of ultimately spit out that candidate that CTPTS needs or that can work with. Mm -hmm. And so the attentiveness on your interview process and hiring process is, at least it has for us, been very helpful in, in reducing said turnover. Because while we're up to nine full-time staff, we we don't have a lot of turnover. The last people that left our clinical staff was Nicole. And that was years ago. Yeah. So it, we've been, maybe that's a little knock on wood. Yeah. Moment. <laughs> but I think if you can focus on that on the front end, then it protects yeah. some of the natural turnover. Yeah. It's just one of those things too, as you grow as a business, as you become a more multi-location practice, um, you know, the, the, like if we saw, we talked about like there's complexity of business that increases, right. And the, the complexity of marketing, the complexity of operations, uh, the talent pool that you have to work with, like all these things have to become more purposeful as you go along. And I, I, I you know, kudos to you guys, cause you're really looking at it from that aspect. And I think that's a big part of your success is that you're very proactive and looking at these, you know, different areas of business systems and operations. And here you are, you know, growing three relocation i'm sure more in the future as you continue to grow and the size of the clinics and everything so um thank you very great. much for, for all that uh, great download today so uh, just kind of wrapping up here any final words of advice uh for our audience out there in terms of uh, marketing your multi-location clinic i um, i think a big thing that i've learned is building trusted relationships with you know whether it's a doctor or anything in your community, an attorney, I mean, that options are en endless. I think building those trusted relationships is, is really big um, into kind of having a, a hold on the, on the community and, and pulling people that way. Um, and then just owning and, and really putting, like we talked about earlier, putting the power behind what you, what you're marketing, what you're saying, and, and making sure that you are delivering on what you're talking about and just have that passion and um, the results will come from, from all of that. It, it's been the yeah. biggest, I'd say, learning yep. curve. It's just being able to, to put the merit behind what you're, what you're speaking to. And, and the, the only, the only thing that I would add to that, and it is more in the relationship side is, is the, what, it, what has truly been shown to me at least, and it's a little bit difficult, a little bit ambiguous is the importance of your people. If you focus on the people you bring into your company, but if you focus on the people that you work with every day, really maximize your interpersonal, yes, relationships, but your interpersonal capabilities, mm -hmm. how hard you can pull on that same rope together. If you focus on that, then the end result 
So, that was end result. Can we cut that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, we got to keep that in. Yeah. But the end result, I always talk about like if you have the best practitioners and you have top notch admin staff, almost by de facto, are you going to have happy patients in a growing business? And so that's, again, it's not so metric based, but really focusing on the culture of your company, your communication from your leadership to your staff, where you're going, how you're going to get there. And then the ability to work well together, I think, are the some of the most important things you can do. Mm -hmm. oh, fantastic advice. I love it. Thank you so much, Colin. So a uh, big thanks to, to Colin and Olivia here for their knowledge download to us. That was fantastic. Thank you for having us. Hopefully uh, somebody got some value from that. <laughs> oh, dude, corporate inertia and uh, ethical <laughs> imperative. We're, we're That's almost, correct. Yeah, I've got to coin that and then give Make you some t-shirts. <laughs> there you go. Thank yeah. you. So, uh, yeah, thanks for being on here. Pleasure. Uh, again, everybody, this is Neil Trickett from Practice Promotion and wishing you much success in your practice. Thank you for listening to the Practice Marketing Podcast. Don't forget to get your free practice marketing sample kit at practicepromotions.net slash kit. Start 2024 off the right way by building marketing systems that automatically attract new patients from online. That's practicepromotions.net slash kit.